Everybody, if you whoa, you just got all the music. Um, my name is Sarah. I'm the associate director here at Calvary Young Adults, and we are so glad you're here. If you're coming in and having trouble finding a seat, we do have some up on this grassy knoll. Um, to everyone online, thank you for joining us. Welcome. It's very hot out here, so you have the better end of the deal, I think, with air conditioning. But you know what? We're glad to be here. Uh, but really, we're so thankful to have you guys. If you notice something new coming in, we just want to address 
we are no longer requiring pre-registration. So with that, guys, thank you so much for all the weeks that you have done so. It is just no longer required by the state of California. So that is gonna be optional for you guys. So if that's a step you don't wanna take, you do not have to, but if you would still like to, you can. If you wanna keep updated, if we can get information to you that way, go ahead and do it. Otherwise, all we ask is that you guys keep wearing your masks and social distancing as you can. We recognize a lot of people are coming with households, with friends that you've been seeing. We wanna honor that, but just ask that you guys would do um, your best to honor people that maybe you haven't been hanging around by social distancing. Cool. And for all updates and more information, you can find us at calvy underscore. That's our Instagram, kind of our main source of communication. If you're new tonight and that's something that you wanna keep up to date with, please go ahead and follow us. We try to just keep it pretty um, communicative and bless you through some worship, some information about our services. Another way you guys can get involved with this ministry um, is by giving. Really simple, you go to calvarywestlake.org. There's a give button. We just want to continue to believe that we have a God who provides through all seasons, and we would encourage you guys to be in prayer about that continually. A um, few quick things we have for you guys as far as announcements go, ways to get involved. The first one we announced last week, we're going to say it again, we have something called Camp Boost coming up with our church. It is through our Calvary Kids Ministry, and what it is, it's like a day camp to bless the families in our community. So we'll be providing a kind of like after school or before school care for kids in the community. There's paid positions through that. So if you have time, if you're working part time and looking for work, if you love kids, if you're looking to even get into teaching, this would be an excellent choice for you. You just text BOOST to the number on the screen, which is our Calvary Westlake number. We'd really encourage you, save it in your phones. Those online, save it in your phones. We use the same number for everything. It's just a quick link that will text back to you and we'll get you guys connected through that. Something we're extra excited for this week is we are finally opening registrations for small groups. So just give me a little whoop if you're in a small group. Yeah, okay, all right. So we got a lot of people maybe we can plug in tonight. That's awesome. Um, this year we are offering small groups both online and then an option to meet here on our campus. So if you're already in a small group, that will be up to your small group leader, but we're gonna provide spots here on Calvary's campus on Monday and Tuesday nights, as well as some online groups for you. We have college age groups, young professional groups, co-ed groups. So if you text this number, you're just gonna get a link to a form and then you can pref whatever group you'd like and we'll get back to you within the next week or so and get that rolling. We believe that life change can happen in those communities. I love my small group and I would encourage you to think about it. Very last thing we have for you guys, this is for you guys online and those who cannot see these tiny little screens. Um, if you're wondering what the worship lyrics are with like the teaching notes, you go to calvarywestlake.org backslash words. So that's all I got as far as announcements. So let's get into a time of worship. I'll leave you with this. It's from 2 Corinthians 4, 8 through 10. And it says, we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our bodies. Join us in worship. Hey guys, I want to start off by just saying that we love you. We're so excited and so glad you guys decided to stay your Thursday night with us and not uh, watching the Laker playoff game. Do not come and find me and tell me the score. I have it recorded. I'll watch it later. But this is a sweet time. We're about to enter into singing as a unit, as one big crew, as one big unit. We represent the body, the, the bride of Christ. And there's power in the song because it actually talks about the power in our singing together. So if you process the lyrics, if you analyze, if you worship to this song, I think there's power that will be exuberated from us tonight and felt and represented in heavenly places. So when you feel so loud, please join us and sing this with us. Sing, did you feel the mountain strong? Did you feel the mountain strong? Did you hear your shapes roar? When the people rose to sing, Jesus Christ, the You can see that God can move. A 
God, thank you for this night. Thank you for giving us a space and a time to worship you, Lord, to freely be in your presence, God. I pray that we can recognize your spirit moving, Lord, that we can recognize your presence, God, and that it would fall fresh on us, Lord, that we would just have peace and comfort during these crazy times in you, Father, that we could just feel your peace and your presence guide us throughout the day, throughout the week, throughout the rest of our lives, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Go ahead and grab a seat. Hey, I want to welcome you again tonight. Welcome those of you watching online right now who can't join us, who aren't able to join us right now. We're glad you're with us online, glad you've leaned in. Uh, whether you're watching online or whether you're here in person right now, I want to invite you to grab your Bible as we do at the beginning of every sermon. Uh, I want you to go to the book of Colossians, chapter 3. Uh, Colossians is this tiny little letter jammed right in the middle of the New Testament. If you don't know where Colossians is, there's no shame in using um, in your holy Bible, your holy table of contents, okay? So no shame and going there, um, finding the book of Colossians, going to the third chapter, that's where we're going to be tonight as we continue a teaching series uh, that we've been doing all summer, kind of in the late summer here, called Rhythm and Ruin. And, and so what we've really been trying to do is talk about the fact that if you're not careful with your life, if you're not thoughtful with your life, you will actually find yourself in a place of ruin because that's where the world is pushing you toward. And so if you're not thinking, if you're not careful, if you're not playing by the rules that God wove into the universe, you'll find yourself in ruin. But then just like in music, um, if you know the rules, if you act on the rules, if you walk in those rules, you'll find yourself living in the rhythms of God's grace in this really beautiful, wonderful way. And so tonight we're going to look at another one of those rules, kind of these rules of rhythm. And here's rule number four. We're in the fourth sermon. Rule number four is this, have a small group of people who you are known by and responsible to. The fourth rule, the one we're going to look at tonight is this idea that you should have a small group of people. And when I say a small group of people, I mean smaller than this, okay? I mean a group of seven or eight people, six or five people, 15 people at most, 25 if you're really extra spiritual, but a small group of people who you are known by. They know your name, they know your story, they know your weaknesses, they know your strengths, they know your humor, they know your jokes, and they know your insecurities. Those people who know you and you are responsible to you see, part of what we need to do as Christians is be a people who are committed to gathering in large groups for worship like this with hundreds of people on a Thursday night, but then also be committed to gathering with one another in these smaller groups where we are known and we are responsible to someone. Now, I want to be really clear. I did not say here that every Christian needs to be part of a formal small group ministry or program at a church. I don't actually believe that's the case. There have been seasons in my life following Jesus where I've been part of a formal small group and seasons where I've not been part of a formal small group, but there were guys in my life who I got around and we get together regularly and intentionally and talk about Jesus. So I need to be clear tonight. I want to talk tonight about small groups, but I don't want you to think this is some big infomercial for our small group ministry here tonight. Like, that's not what this is. That's not where I'm pushing you. My goal is not to fill up the small group ministry here. My goal is to get you to understand that if you do not build people into your life who know you and you are responsible toward, your life is heading toward ruin. That's what I want us to see tonight. And so listen, tonight I'm not going to try to convince you to be in a small group. If you're just one of those people who go, I'm never going to be known, I'm never going to be responsible to anyone, you wrestle before Jesus on that, uh, and I think he's going to win that one. But you go wrestle with him. Tonight I don't want to talk to you about how. Because I think the Bible actually gives us instructions on how we're supposed to gather together and what that relationship's supposed to look like. And I think you'll see that here in Colossians chapter 3. And so again, Colossians, tiny little letter right in the middle of the New Testament, chapter 3. Uh, we'll begin in verse 11 if you got your Bibles with you. If not, it'll be on the screens. And for those of you who are like way up there, we're working on some screen solutions sometime later. But here we are. Um, COVID. <laughs> Am I right? All right. Colossians 3, verse 11. Here's how it begins. It says here. There is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian or Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is in all and is all. So tonight I'm going to try to give some really specific instructions and some really practical wisdom from the scriptures and from the hand of Paul, guided by the Holy Spirit tonight, um, that you would know how to be in groups, be in relationship, be in biblical community with one another. But the thing I'm always going to try to point out in the scriptures is that gospel imperatives always come on the heels of gospel indicatives. And this is this big theological word, so let me try to break it down for you. What you should do is always a result of what God has done. 
In the Bible, it is always going to tell you what to do on the basis of what Christ has already done for you. So the Bible is not just a list of commands of ways you're supposed to behave, but it's always God has forgiven you, therefore do this. God has loved you, therefore do this. God has given you his command, therefore go this. It's always God moving first and you responding. And that's what we see here in verse 11. It's here, there is no Jew, Gentile, circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, which is just a a race of people who are pretty much hated in the ancient world, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. But like in other words, the whole thing we're gonna talk about tonight is not based on how awesome you are or how good you are at getting together and being a Christian with other people. It's based on what God has done. God has pulled us together. God has brought us together. God has made us one people. God has made something like this possible. This whole night that we're doing here tonight is possible because God made it possible. The reason you come to the same church as the person sitting up there or back there or three seats to the right of you is because God has brought us together. It's not because you agree on everything. It's not because you look like each other. It's not because you vote like each other, talk like each other, listen to the same kind of music or anything else. It's because God has brought people together. And this is this really ancient teaching in the scriptures that if we're not careful, we'll forget about. One of the most ancient teachings of the scriptures is that God brings people together that should otherwise be apart. One of the most ancient teachings of the scripture is that God is not a discriminator of persons, but rather gathers all who would come before his son, Jesus. And what a wonderful reminder of how important it is to remember the ancient teaching of scripture when we face modern problems. But like how much better would our world, our culture, our nation be if we found ourselves in a place where people said, because God has brought us together, nothing will tear tear us apart. Like, Like what a wonderful thing to consider in the face of everything we're seeing in our world today to remember that God had an answer for this thousands of years ago. And that answer is Christ brings it all together. Like you need to not miss this. This is part of what the Bible has to say when it comes to the conversation about race in our country. All right? This is part of what the Bible has to say. The Bible's gonna say more than this, but this is part of it. And the part of it here that you'll see is that there is no, in this, here, in this, there's no Gentile or Jew, circumcised, uncircumcised. He's comparing and contrasting all of these things. He says those things aren't the relevant categories here. What does that mean? I'll tell you what it doesn't mean. This isn't the Bible trying to eliminate anything you would identify with other than Jesus. So it's not that like it's not relevant that that you're black or a woman or American or immigrant or Jewish or rich or poor. It's not saying those things don't matter at all. But here's what it is saying. This does not impact your standing before God. And on the flip side of it, there is no privileged group that gets to claim something about God that other groups don't get to claim. This might seem utterly non-exciting to you, but in the ancient world, this is one of the most scandalous things that the earliest Christians would say. This is why Christians got murdered and killed and belittled and mocked, because they had the courage to stand up in a world that said those people are excluded from God and those people aren't, and say everyone gets to come before God. That's the kind of place we want to build here, where everyone gets to come before God, where we see everyone and we say, no one's excluded, no one's kicked out of here. Like, I need you to know this young adults ministry, this church, wherever you're at, whatever your background, nationality, race, culture, whatever you lifestyle you've walked in, I need you to know you are welcomed here and welcome to come to Jesus. And why is that? Here's what it says. Two reasons. Number one, Christ is in all, or Christ is all. That's the first part it says. Like, Christ is everything. Jesus is everything. You don't earn it. You don't deserve it. You haven't done anything to earn God's favor. It's Christ. Jesus is everything for your salvation. And then Christ is in all. But like ultimately, the only reason you would exclude someone, the only reason you would be racist, the only reason you would be bigoted against someone, the only reason you would push someone away is because you don't believe that the spirit of Christ lives inside of them. You don't believe that they are vessels of God's Holy Spirit. And so what we want to create here is the type of place where everyone's welcome and no one is excluded. Again, the Bible is going to teach more than this when it comes to race, but it's not less than this. And what this is teaching so emphatically is that if we are going to be the type of church God calls us to be, we have to be a church for everyone. We have to be that kind of church. The old preachers put it this way. They said this phrase. They said, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. Like they're trying to say that no one comes to Jesus with some kind of advantage. No one comes to Jesus with some kind of privilege. And no one comes to Jesus at a disadvantage. And no one comes to Jesus with a limb. Everyone comes before Jesus at the same footing. And he welcomes everyone in. 
Again, the Bible is going to teach more about this when it comes to race, but it's not going to teach less. It's going to teach more about this when it comes to including people, but it's not going to teach less. That the Bible abolishes the categories of the types of people who can come before God and says that everyone is welcome. Everyone gets to come in. Everyone gets to join in to the kingdom of God when they seek after. It goes on this way in verse 12. It says, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, I won't spend forever on this as much as to identify. I want you to memorize this part of scripture. This is short. It's easy. It says that you are God's chosen people. You are holy and you are dearly loved. And child of God, if you ever forget this, if you ever lose sight of this, you will lose sight of the good, great love that God has for you. It says that you are chosen, holy, and dearly loved. Here's what that means. Chosen means God picked you. God wanted you. Like, I just wonder if someone here tonight needs to know that God looked in eternity past, saw your life, and thought you were worth picking worth dying for. To the person here who's never been picked, who's never been wanted, who's always been excluded, do you know that there is a father in heaven who said, I would do anything to get you in my family, including losing my son's life, his life on the cross for you. You've picked. Like God picked you. He wanted you. He chose you. Holy said God chose you, or chosen said God wanted you. Holy said God forgives you. Like, do you know, child of God, that God looks at you and says you're holy? You might not feel holy, but the scriptures say you're holy. You may not feel holy before God, but that's how he describes you. Like what a remarkable thing that the God of the universe would look at you and would look at me in all of our sinful fallenness and declare that we are holy and forgiven. What a remarkable thing about our God. Now I wanna speak to some people here, to the young man who's here tonight, who's struggling with a pornography addiction. I want you to know that God looks at you. The God of heaven sees you and doesn't see you as a foul, sinful person, but looks at you and says, holy. To the young lady here who has a past and you're embarrassed about it, you're walking in shame, you feel like you've never been enough for anyone, the God of the universe looks at you, not in your past and in your shame, but looks and goes, that woman is holy. It's holy because of what my son Jesus has accomplished. To the person who's walking into their shame, the person in addiction, to the person in their sin, to the person who feels like they've never measured up for anyone, God looks at you and declares you as holy. This is remarkable. There is no end to the amount of greatness in this statement that God would look at you and call you holy despite everything you've done. Chosen, God wants you. Holy, God forgave you. And then he says, you are dearly loved, which means this, God is quite fond of you. Maybe someone needs to write that sentence down. God is quite fond of me, because it's true. Like, I wonder if someone here needs to hear that God doesn't just love you, he likes you. He likes being around you. He likes talking to you. He likes when you pray. He likes when you're in the word. He likes when you think about him and talk about him. God's not begrudgingly putting up with you. God likes you. He is fond of you. He is crazy about you. But like the scriptures describe a love that God has for you. That's not some sort of religious activity that you participate in. What the scriptures describe is a God who is crazy about you. You are chosen. He picked you. You are holy. He forgave you. And you are dearly loved. He is quite fond of you. It goes on this way. It says, therefore, as these type of people, it says, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, and gentleness. Now, here's one of the things I love about the Bible. Um, I love looking at the scriptures and realizing that the Bible is written to real people living in the real world. That the Bible is not a set of nice ideas for super holy people. It's written as a serious document and a serious word for those of us who live in the real world. Like, let me put it to you this way, and I'll explain why I say this. I want to make the assumption based on this text that the Bible assumes that you will deal with difficult people every single day. Do you recognize that? Like the Bible assumes you're going to deal with difficult, frustrating, annoying people who grate up against you every single day. And the reason I say that is because of what language Paul uses here. Notice Paul in the text doesn't say, decide to be compassionate, kind, humble, gentle, and patient. No, he uses a different metaphor. He says, clothe yourself with these things. Like you ever thought about clothes? Let's think about pants for a second, which is a sentence you don't hear a lot in church, okay? Let's think about your pants. I want you to think about the fact that you put on pants today, but you know what you did the day before? You put on pants. You know what you're going to do tomorrow? You're going to put on pants. You put on pants not just once, you put them on every single day over and over and over again. And a new day comes, and guess what you have to do again? Put on pants. Unless you have one of those glorious days where you don't have to put on pants, but that's a different subject. You put them on every day. And here's this beautiful metaphor Paul's using here. He's using this idea. He doesn't say decide to be compassionate. He says put on compassion. Like in other words, he knows you're going to have to put it on every day because almost every day you're going to encounter someone who's hurting and you're not going to care. So you put on compassion. 
You got to put on patience because every single day you're going to run across that, that person at work, like that colleague who's extra annoying, but now they're on Zoom and now they're like extra, extra annoying, right? And so you're so annoyed with them. So you got to be patient with them. So let's put on kindness. Like in other words, you're going to come across situations where you are angry at people and you don't want to treat them with grace. And God says, you got to put on kindness. You got to put it on. It doesn't just naturally happen. You got to put on humility. Like you're going to be tempted every single day to think you're better than someone else. You're going to be tempted every single day to think you're above someone else, that they're not even deserving of your time. And can you say this here, you got to put on humility. So you think the metaphor of clothes is the perfect metaphor for how we have to handle people every single day. The Bible assumes we're going to deal with difficult people every day. So I got to keep putting these things on over and over again. When I drive into work, when I get up, when I see my roommates, when I start going to school, when I do whatever I do, I got to keep putting these things on because it doesn't come naturally to me. And it doesn't come naturally to you. Kindness, compassion, uh, um, humility, none of these things come naturally to you. And then let me talk about this in the small group space. Um, I just want to make this statement for you. If you're going to join a small group, if you're in a small group, if you've ever been in a small group, here's the statement. I want you to assume that you will deal with difficult people in your small group. If you're signing up for a small group with the assumption, I'll find a bunch of people who are just like me in every way and they'll never bother me, please don't sign up for a small group, okay? You will sign up for a small group and you'll enter into that group and you will find people just like you. And you know what people just like you are? They're people just like me who are annoying and selfish and frustrating and into themselves all the time. That's what you'll find in our small groups. And so if your assumption is I'll sign up for a small group at Calvary and everything will be perfect all the time, you'll ruin the small group. Instead, you assume, listen, I'm going to deal with people in my group and sometimes they're going to frustrate me. Sometimes they're going to let me down. Sometimes they're going to talk too much in group or sometimes they're not going to talk enough. Sometimes they're going to bring up the same point over and over and over again and I'll just get really sick of them. You assume going in, I'm going to deal with difficult people. So what do you do on your drive to small group? You clothe yourself in compassion. You clothe yourself in kindness. You clothe yourself in patience and humility and gentleness because you assume there are going to be difficult people in the group. Here's how it continues on in verse 13. It gets actually worse for us. It says, bear with each other. Bear with each other. Which always makes me think of a bear, but that's not actually what is going on here. It says, bear with one another, which, which is actually this idea that you're actually called biblically. This is a command on your life to put up with annoying people. Like this is not a command any of us like, Right? But you are actually called to bear with one another. To bear with one another isn't addressing the deepest, darkest, most brutal sins of this world. It's the fact that you have roommates you love, and you probably have roommates who bother you in some ways. You probably have a roommate who doesn't do the dishes as much as they should, right? You probably have a sister who talks too much in the morning, right? You probably have a colleague who bothers you in the way she handles herself, at work. You, you probably have someone at school, maybe a teacher, maybe a friend, maybe a, a, a student who's working with you, and, and she just drives you insane. Or, or you have someone in your small group or a friend of yours who doesn't invite you to things or who forgets about you or forgets to text you back. Here's the Bible's command. Bear with one another. Like, here's the simple way to put it. Deal with it. Like, this is what we're called to do as Christians. We're supposed to deal with the fact that people are annoying and frustrating and irritating and sometimes forget to text us back and sometimes forget to love us the way we should be loved. We bear with one another. And, and then here's maybe just the moment I want to speak into for our culture right now. Like there just exists this idea out there. And maybe you've bought into it or maybe you've just seen it out there. But there exists this idea that, that, that when it comes to politics and worldview, that if someone doesn't agree with you or vote like you or have the same worldview as you, you're not supposed to be friends with them. You're not supposed to be around them because the other side isn't just wrong. They're evil. And here's what we need to say as Christians. Here's what we say is that to a church. No, absolutely not. That is not the gospel. It is not the kingdom of heaven. It is not the kingdom of God. It is not the church we are trying to build. I want you to know that if you are looking for a church where everyone agrees with you and everyone's on the same page and no one ever disagrees and the pastor gets up and says exactly what you were hoping I was going to say, you might find that church. I just promise it won't be here. Because here's what you need to know. Democrats, you're welcome here. Republicans, you're welcome here. Trump voters, you're welcome here. Biden voters, you're welcome here. Liberals, conservatives, someone who's like, I don't define myself. You're welcome here too. You're welcome. We want you here. We want this to be the type of place where we bear with one another. And believe me, bearing with one another does not mean agreeing with one another in everything. I follow a lot of you on social media. And let me tell you, I bear with a lot of stuff, okay? 
I see what you post and it drives me crazy. But listen, I love you and I'm gonna bear with you. And hear me, if I laid out all of my political views, some of you would like stand up and storm off and be like, never again, right? But what are we called to do? We're called to bear with one another, to put up with the fact that you're not like the people over here and that's the best possible thing for your life. And if you build your life in such a way that the only people you talk to and hang out with are the people who think exactly like you do, you will have a shrinking, shrinking, shrinking circle of friends until eventually you're alone, but you feel like you're right. And that's not what we're called to as Christians. What we're called to do is be in groups, small groups of people who know us and we're accountable too. And those groups are gonna disagree. They're gonna have different opinions on politics and on faith and on how to read the Bible and on how to go about the world. They're gonna have differences of opinion on food and whether or not Coke or Pepsi or, or Chick-fil-A or In-N-Out, like which is the best. They're gonna have differences in opinions and we're called to bear with one another. That's what the scriptures say here. It's a command of God to bear with one another. And then it goes on this way. It says, and forgive one another. If any one of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. So if you were with us earlier this year, um, you know that we did a whole series on forgiveness, and, and I won't actually go into all of that tonight. I do want to invite you seriously, though, if you think forgiveness is something the Lord's been tugging on your heart, go back to our podcast on whatever platform you're on. Go all the way back to January. First sermon series of the year was all about forgiveness, and so I, I promise you, you'll find tons of information there about what forgiveness is and isn't and how to go down that road. But real briefly, like forgiveness isn't forgetting, right? Forgiveness isn't you just forgetting about what they did to you. Forgiveness isn't saying, oh, it wasn't so bad. Forgiveness isn't saying, oh, it's water under the bridge. Let's not worry about it. No, no. Forgiveness is acknowledging the hurt that happened. Forgiveness is rediscovering the humanity of the person who hurt you. It's choosing not to let that event define them, and it's choosing not to let that desire for revenge define the rest of your life. And then it's changing your posture toward that person so that they no longer get to control you. See, ultimately, the command to forgive in the Bible is not primarily for the person who hurts you. It's for you. It's for you. And so, again, if you want to go on that journey of forgiveness, I do recommend our series to you on that. You can go back on the podcast and check that out. But I need you to understand that forgiveness is primarily a thing that you do to release the pain and the hurt and the domination of what that person did to you in your own heart. But then I need you to know this. That forgiveness is not just something you do for yourself in isolation. Forgiveness is the only thing that actually makes it possible to live in community with one another, to live in a biblical community, even a small group. Like I want you to know this, that a small group cannot endure without forgiveness. It can't. It is impossible if you are part of a small group of people, whether it is a formal Calvary small group or whether it is just a group of friends who love Jesus and walk together, it is impossible for your friendships to endure without forgiveness. Because forgiveness is the only way we undo the wounds we do to one another. And if you are naive enough to believe that you're all good Christians so you'll never wound one another, you just haven't lived long enough. Like if you live long enough, you learn that really good Christian men and women sometimes wound each other. And forgiveness is the only healing balm there is. So the person here who's like, I just don't know if I can be in a small group anymore. I don't know if I want to be in with her after what she did to me or what he did to me or what happened back then. I need you to know that the only road out is forgiveness. And I think if you walk that road, you'll be glad you did, that we forgive one another. How? Just as Christ forgave us. It goes on this way in verse 14. It says, and above all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body, you were called to peace. And be thankful. Hey, here's what I want to point out, three words in this text we just read in verse 14. I want to point out the word love. I want to point out the word peace. And I want to point out the word thankful. I believe the way we should assess our own lives and assess the effectiveness of what we are doing as we follow Jesus is with these words, with love and with peace and with gratitude. Like that's what you should be assessing in your own heart. Like when someone asks you, this, this is kind of off the rails a little bit, but I, I just feel like to say this for someone. When someone asks you, how are you doing in your walk with Jesus? Can you please stop responding with how many times you've read your Bible this week? Can you please stop responding with how many times you've gone to church? I want you to assess instead, how much are you loving people? How at peace are you? How grateful are you for things in your life? Because listen, you can read your Bible every single day of the week and not really be close to Jesus at all. You can come to church all the time. You can come to church more times than you should and show up at everything possible and not really be close to Jesus. The real assessment tool is, are you walking in love? Are you walking in peace? Are you walking in gratitude? Are these things flowing out of your life? That's the way we assess whether or not we're walking closely with Jesus. 
not with how many religious activities we're doing. But, but here's why I think this is significant for the small group conversation we're having tonight. Um, I, I've been convinced for a long time that if you ask the wrong questions, you might get the right answers, but they'll be unhelpful answers. So you ask the wrong questions, you can get the right answer, but they're not a helpful answer. And, and so oftentimes what I see is people in small groups are asking the wrong question to assess whether or not they should stay in their small group or whether or not they should commit to one. And, and here's what I want to suggest to you. There is a bad question that you and I often ask when it comes to a small group gathering, whether it's a formal one or whether it's just getting together with the guys or with the gals. Here is the bad question. Did I get anything out of group tonight? And oftentimes people ask this. Did I get anything out of group tonight? And sometimes you walk away and you say, wow, I really got something out of that tonight. And sometimes you walk away and go, I didn't really get anything out of that tonight. And here's what we mean by that. We didn't learn something new. We didn't figure out some new insight. We didn't have an emotional moment. There weren't tears. There weren't something like that. And here's what I need you to know. I've been in a small group now for seven years in a row. In 2013, I started a small group with four other married couples here at the church. We've continued in that small group, my wife and I. And I need you to know that more times than not, I lead small group and I didn't get anything out of it. I mean, I didn't learn some new fact about the Bible. I didn't learn some new thing. There wasn't some huge breakthrough moment. It wasn't like, wow, this is blowing my mind tonight. I leave and I didn't get anything out of it. So that's the right answer, but here's what I'm convinced of. It's the wrong question. Here's a better question and a question you might want to ask. Are the people in my group helping me grow in love, in peace, and in gratitude? That's the better question. The better question isn't, what did I get out of this tonight? It's over the long haul. Are these people helping me to be a more loving person, a more peaceful person, and a more grateful person? And it is a more nuanced question, and it is a harder question to answer. But believe me, it is the better question of the two. It's like this. Here's how small groups work, and here's how growth in small groups work. I want you to imagine uh, on a hot day like today, I I walked out with a garden hose right out here, and I went up to this tree, and I just stood by the tree with the hose and turned it on full blast and stood there for 10 minutes and just soaked the ground all around the tree. I want you to imagine I turned the hose off and someone asked me, well, did what you just do watering that tree, did that help the tree grow? Did that make the tree grow? And the answer is kind of like yes and no, right? Right? Like that one moment I stood there with the hose didn't make the tree grow. And at the same time, the fact that this tree is watered over and over and over and over again in little bits does make the tree grow. Or a different metaphor for some of you. Imagine you go to the gym and you work out. You lift weights. You get a really good lift session in. That kind where you're like a little sore and then the next day you're not sure you want to live anymore. Like that kind of lifting weights. So you do that. And then someone asks you, well, did you go into the gym and lifting weights make you stronger? Did it make you have big muscles? And the answer is kind of like yes and no, right? Like that exact moment, no. It's not like you go to the gym, you lift once, and you're like Popeye, right? Like that's not how it works. But here's how it works. You go over and over and over and over again, and you wake up years later, and you realize that you've grown in strength, that you've grown in stature. This is how it works with spiritual growth, and this is how it works with small groups. Like the question isn't tonight, did I get anything out of it? It's over time, has me hanging out with these people made me more loving? Does it make me want to love my family more? Does it make me want to love my mom more? Does it make me want to love my colleagues more and the lost more? Does it make me want to love more? Does it make me want to be at peace more? Like, is me being around these people, like, do I become this non-anxious presence when I'm around them? Or do these people wind me up into more drama? And then finally, do these people help me be more grateful? Do these people help me become this grateful person who's just grateful for life and breath in my lungs every morning, who's grateful for every bite of food and everything in my life, who's just grateful? That's the right question to ask. And it takes time, and it's slow, but it's good. Here's the phrase I want to put into your mind. If I can put this three-word phrase into someone's mind tonight, I believe this will impact the spiritual growth of your life for the rest of your days. Three words. Here's what I want you to do as you consider small groups, as you consider how spiritual formation happens. Here's the three words. Trust the process. Trust it. Trust the process. Some of you are the type of people who will never trust a process unless you're sure it's going to work on the front end. And I'm promising you, if you will trust the process, God will grow you. If you trust this bizarre process that happens when a bunch of Christians get together and you sit in the living room or sit outside because it's COVID, right? Okay, we sit outside and sit around a fire, socially distanced. We have our Bible open and we talk about the Bible and we talk about life and we pray together and we bear with one another because there are some annoying people in your group. Let's just face it. And if you think there's no annoying people in your group, (laughs) I've got news for you, right? Like you're it. Um, And so like you, this is what we do. We do this bizarre process, but here's what happens. 
in this jumbled mess of loving each other and showing up and studying the Bible and praying for each other and having an obnoxious group chat and all of that, Jesus grows us. That's the process. It doesn't happen overnight, but over the long haul, you become this type of person who's more like Jesus, more loving, more at peace, more grateful. And I just promise some of you, if you would trust the process, if you would stop demanding that everything happen all at once, that your whole spiritual life be flipped upside down in a moment, if you would trust the long-term process, I promise God would do something spectacular in your life. Here's how it goes on in verse 16. It says, let the message of Christ dwell among you richly. That, that word message there in the scriptures is the Greek word logos. It's this word, this, the idea of the message of Jesus, the core of who he is, this word of God that goes out. The logos is the word. In John chapter 1, when it says the word became flesh, the word was with God. It's the logos. And this is what's being talked about here. This is the message of Jesus. It says, let it dwell richly among you. Like almost let it be like this aroma in the air around you that every time you gather together with other Christians, the message of Jesus is present explicitly, not implicitly. But like, here's what I think this means on a practical level. I want to talk about what should happen every single time your group meets. And again, whether that's a formal small group or some kind of group you've pulled together, every time your group meets, the Bible should be read. Well, like, I know that sounds like eminently obvious, but here's what can happen for groups. You like get together and you're talking about the week and you're laughing about things and suddenly you've been together for like three hours and you're like, we haven't opened the Bible. And then you feel kind of guilty about it, but you're like, no one's here to shame us. So you just leave, right? Like that's what can happen to groups. And here's what I want you to do. Just commit to every time you're going to be together, you're going to open the Bible. Even if you're studying some other book, you're like working through some other book. I'm doing that right now with my small group. We're still just going to read the scriptures. We're going to listen to the word of God. The other night, my group got together and we ended up talking for so long because we've all got kids and families and all these crazy things going on. It was a two-hour meeting. For an hour and 45, we talked and we went, oh my gosh, we haven't read the Bible at all. And so here's what we did. We were supposed to study 1 Peter chapter 4. We didn't end up studying it. We just read it aloud popcorn style. And it was awesome because it was like you're reading and you're like, popcorn, you, right? And you're like hoping to catch them. You never do because they're adults. But anyway, my point is that every time you get together, the Bible gets open, like explicitly read. And then here's the second thing, that every time you get together, the gospel should be remembered. But like, let your groups be the type of place where the gospel is explicitly remembered, where someone's sharing about their addiction or their sin or their bondage, and you go, hey, hey, listen, listen, I want to help you out of that, but I need you to remember that Jesus came into this world to die for people like you because he loves you and he cares about you. No, no, I need you to remember that Jesus bore your shame on the cross, and you need to not live in this shame anymore. Jesus lifted that off of you. Like the gospel, the good news that Jesus Christ died and rose from the dead for sinners should be verbalized every time, or else your Bible study becomes a lecture on theology, or it becomes a self-help group where you get together, and you pool your ignorance together and try to figure out how to live this life. No, the Bible needs to be talked about explicitly and the gospel needs to be brought up constantly, constantly, constantly reminding each other that it is the blood of Jesus that makes us whole. It is the death of Jesus that gives us life. It is the resurrection of Jesus that gives us hope. That should happen every time we gather. And then here's, we're getting toward the end here. Here's what it says. As you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Um, I, I love how it talks about we're teaching. So I mean, there, there is this educational process where we're learning things um, when we're together, but there's also admonishing, which is like us, like kind of stirring one another, coming, like, come on guys, like do this, like, come on, take this seriously. Don't be the type of person who doesn't, that's admonishing. And then it says to do this in, in my text here, it says to one another. And this one another phrase is really famous throughout the scriptures. It's like all these things we're supposed to do for one another. Like there's no one here who's like, I can help other people, but no one can help me. Like everyone is called to help one another in the body of Christ. And here's what I'm convinced of, that you need other people to help you. Like you need them. Like you are just not capable of following Jesus alone. Someone needs to hear that tonight. You are not capable of following Jesus alone. You can try to do it, but it will burn you out. It will torture you. You cannot follow Jesus alone. Here's at least three reasons. Number one, uh, you need people to help you remember because you're really bad at it. You are. <laughs> this is my favorite part of sermons. I'm like, you're terrible. Everyone's like, you're right. You know, like, but you're terrible. You don't remember anything. Like God promises things. God gives you these good promises that he'll never fail you in the scriptures and we forget about them all the time. God has been faithful in your past. He has showed up in incredible ways and we forget about it all the time. God has shown up. He has been there in his presence and his goodness. He has healed the wounds of your past and we forget about it all the time. You know what your small group should be? A place of remembrance, 
a place of like, yeah, yeah, I, I know you're going through that right now, but do you remember two years ago you were going through something and God showed up and was faithful? I know you're going through right now, but you remember that God says in the book of Philippians, he'll meet all of your needs in Christ Jesus. I, I know you're walking through this right now, but remember, don't forget what God did. See, we need people to help us remember because frankly, we're really bad at it. I'm really bad at it. I forget what God has done. The next is repent because you don't think you need to. Like you need people in your life who have the ability and have permission to call you toward repentance. If you have not looked another adult human being in the eye at some point in your life and said, you have permission to tell me to repent when I'm being an idiot, you need to do that. Do that tonight before you go to bed. Do that before this weekend. Do that soon. Look at another human being in the eye and say, I need you to be the type of friend. I desperately need you to be the type of friend who is going to look me in the eye and tell me when I'm being so dumb, but I don't even see it. See, that's what repentance needs. We need people who are willing to call us to it in a kind, in a gracious, in a compassionate way, but also in a firm way that says, I see where you're going, and if you don't turn, you're walking straight off a cliff, and I need to warn you. Like, we need people to help us repent because you don't think you need to, and then finally, you need people to help you repair because you don't really want to. You don't want to. Like God calls you to be in this repairing business, this restoration business, this reconciliation business with him. Like, like, you need people in your life to tell you, like, your prayer life is totally off right now, and you need to repair something with God. You, you and that person got into this kind of fight or this squabble or this thing that was going on. There's some drama going on. I saw you gossiping about her. You actually really wounded her in this moment, and you need to repair that relationship. We need other people to stir us, too, because, listen, we never want to do it. And then maybe you need people in your life to help you repair your relationship with yourself. Like you've always talked about yourself in this negative, horrible, trashing way where you just look at yourself and you're disgusted with you and you need someone to help you repair your relationship with yourself. Like, hear me, you need people in your life. You cannot do this alone. Uh, again, if that's a small group formally, great. If that is not a small group and you just have people in your life who do this intentionally, wonderful. But you cannot do this thing alone. Here's the final scripture, verse 17. It says, and whatever you do in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. One of the things God's been speaking to me a ton in this season um, is about being thankful for God, not just for what he has done, not just for what he is doing, but being thankful for God for what he will do in the future but has not done yet. Like, I want to be the type of Christian who looks ahead into this next year, into a school year for some of you, into this fall, and goes, God, I want to thank you for what you're going to do in September. Because you're going to show up in September. I don't even know what you're going to do. I just want to thank you in advance. I want my praise to be proactive. I don't always want to be looking back at what God did. I want to look forward to what he will do and know that he can and know that he will. That's the kind of gratitude we're called to have. And that's the kind of gratitude I have for your lives. But listen, if there's even 10 people here who will take this sermon seriously, who will take Colossians chapter 3 seriously on what Paul has to say here and actually build this community where everyone's welcome and no one's excluded and you love one another in the ways Jesus tried to love you and calls you to love others, I just want to thank God in advance for what he's going to do in your life because he's going to make you more like Jesus. You're going to reach December. You're going to reach Christmas more like Jesus than you are right now. And that's worth thanking God for. It's worth praising God for. It's worth looking forward and believing that God is going to do great things, even though it hasn't happened yet. That's how we have this gratitude for what God has done, for what God is doing, and for what God will do. So here's how I want to end um, tonight um, with two distinct calls to action. Um, here's the first. Um, I I've said this a million times. I'll say it one last time. Um, I do not believe in order to be in Christian community, you have to join a small group at Calvary, right? That's not the only option, but it is a great option. It is a phenomenal option for some of you. And if that's you tonight, here, here's simply what I want you to do. Uh, you can, it's so easy to sign up, like literally so easy. You text this word, YA group, to this phone number. And it's for those of you who can see it on screen, you'll see it here. For those of you that can't see it, it's the phone number we use for everything else, but it's 818-405-8445. 818-405-8445. If tonight you're going, listen, I need people in my life. I've been avoiding people in my life. Maybe I was supposed to go off to college, but then that didn't happen and they booted me back here and I'm online only and I'm just here for a year. Great, join a small group for one year because you need people. You can't do this without people. I insist that if you want to follow Jesus according to the Bible, on God's authority, on the authority of the word of God, you cannot do this thing alone because you weren't built to do this thing alone. So again, I want to invite some people tonight to text that number. Let me, let me say this. If you have your phone in your hand and you're part of a group already, can you just text the guys or girls in your group and just tell them you love them? You're grateful for them? 
Maybe some of you just need to text, and maybe they're not all here tonight. Just say, hey, we heard a sermon tonight about small group and how we can operate, and I just want to say thank you. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for pointing me to Jesus. Thank you for helping me remember God's promises and his goodness and his love toward me. I want to challenge you to do exactly that. And then there's a final group I want to talk to, um, and that's the group that is not just going to not join a Calvary small group. You're not going to have a group of people in your life outside of the small group system, but you just don't want anyone in your life. You don't want to be known. You don't want to be accountable to. Uh, you think you can follow Jesus on your own. You've got this thing here. Here's just the question I want to leave you with. And I want you to wrestle with Jesus. You don't owe me an answer, but I want to put this question before someone. Can you be obedient to the commands, these commands of Colossians chapter 3, without a small group of people that you are known by and responsible to? Like, can you do it? Can you be obedient to those commands in Scripture? Because if you can be obedient to the commands of God in Scripture, but you don't have that group, again, that's for you to wrestle before God. But here's what I've been convinced of my entire life. I can't do it on my own. Like, I am not capable of following Jesus on my own. I need people. I need people who challenge me. I, know people who know, I need people who know me, and I need people who hold me accountable. And that's true for me. I think it's true for you as well. So I invite someone here to jump into that kind of relationship. If you're not ready to do that, maybe even Calvary's not your home church. I know some of you are visiting, listening online. You're visiting from other churches because you're not quite open yet. Uh, I invite you to go to your own churches. Find a small group there. Plug into a group of people, and I think you'll be glad you did. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thanks for tonight. Thanks for your holy word. Um, God, I, I know that perhaps for someone tonight, they needed to hear this. I know that perhaps for someone tonight, they needed to listen closely um, to your word and how it challenges us in our relationships and the way we work with people. God, I want to pray for small groups this year at Calvary. I want to pray for the men and women who will lead those groups. God, would you fill them with wisdom and courage and gifting in every possible way? I pray for the people who will join those groups, who are taking a step of faith even tonight to step into a group, and maybe they've never been in one before. God, I pray you would bless their faith. I pray you would bless their courage. I pray that you would do that. God, I pray for the people who are home now from college, who didn't think they'd be home from college, but they are. God, I pray you would give them a soft landing place where they can come together with other people who are in the same spot. God, help us grow in Jesus. Help us be the type of church, the type of community you built us to be. Help us be the type of place where no one's excluded, where no one's kicked out, where no one's not welcome, where no one has special access or no one's barred. Help us be the type of place where none of those categories are determinative for how we approach you. But help Jesus be all for us and help Jesus be in us all. So God, even as we worship right now, I pray you would fill us with the faith to believe that you've done great things in the past. You're doing great things now. And we believe fall 2020, you're going to do mighty things in the name of Jesus. And all God's people said who agreed real loud. Amen. Amen. Just stand as we sing. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever bring. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever sing. Worthy of every breath we could ever bring. We live for you.
every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Oh, King Jesus, Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Oh, we live for you.
So we mention this every week before we keep worshiping. We have another opportunity for worship. So as, as many of you have recognized or noticed, like this has been a time of worship through singing. And I believe worship is no less than singing, but it's also a whole lot more. Um, thank you, Brian, for that one. Um, we have prayer walls here. So we have one right here. And what you do is you kind of just hop up. I have notes. Hold on. You grab a pen from the clean pen basket. You write it. You write out your prayer, clip it on the wall, and then you put that pen in the dirty pen basket because we're not trying to, you know, risk it for the biscuit. And then over here, we have another. It's a really, really little one. Um, Gavin, can you wave? It's right by Gavin, right by him. And so that's going to be for, like, the lawn side or anyone over here. Um, if you want to make the trek over here, please feel free. But fill up those walls or fences, I don't know. But I promise you, we have like collectives of people who pray for these prayers. There's like a prayer thing that goes out. So, you, you know, you don't have to put your name. You don't have to do anything. You can put your name. You do not have to. And I promise you, they will be prayed for. I'm one of those people. Brian's one of those people. The other Brian's one of those people. Um, yeah, let's worship through prayer as well. We have one more song to do, so you have that amount of time. You can also go up after the service is over and put a prayer up if you want. But feel free, use this time. Choose your own adventure worship. Prayer, sing, do your thing, connect to Jesus, and worship.
God, I just thank you for how you're moving, Lord God, in this ministry, Lord God, in our lives. Jesus, I thank you for just your hand of peace over us through these upcoming seasons, Lord God, whatever they may bring, Lord God, you're with us. Peace over our school, peace over our work, over our home lives, over our relationships, God. Set our crooked path straight, Lord God. And help us walk in the purpose that you provided for us, Father God. I thank you for this night. I thank you for moving. You are good today, tomorrow, and yesterday. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, everyone. I'm just so thankful to get to come here every Thursday and get to join in with you guys and all the earth and praise God. What what a wonderful thing. Uh, I'm just thankful to get to be here with you. Thank you for coming tonight and being a part of this with me because <laughs> I'm, I'm happy about it. <laughs> Hope you are too. Um, I have a couple of things I want to share before we go out the door, and that's just uh, small groups. If, if you uh, want to go through this system this way, um, text YA group to a number that will be up on the screen in a moment. Sorry, Diane, I did not prep you for this. Um, there we go. Thank you, Diane. She's on it. Um, second thing is uh, Boost, Camp Boost, as Sarah talked about before. I talked with Nate and uh, Stephen earlier, who are the two people who are kind of heading this thing, and they're like, man, all the people who have applied so far, we love it. <laughs> we love them. And so they're like, we want more people from YA <laughs> to come and work and serve. And so if you're looking for a job, check it out. So just text Boost to that same number, and you'll get a link to an application and stuff. Um, and then finally, uh, I hope you have a great week. <laughs> hope you have a great week. And if there's anything any of you guys need, um, come talk with Sarah or I. There's, there, we want to be there for you. Uh, not just Sarah and I, but us, the, the church in general, we're here for you. And so um, we want to talk. We have listening ears and willing hearts. And uh, if you need to talk with someone, if you need someone to talk with, please reach out to us. That's all I got. Thank you. See you next week. (laughs) Have a great night, everybody.